Freaky Noon Radio, where we talk about emerging issues and talk to independent thinkers who are shaping commerce culture. Joining us today, Joe Redston from the United Kingdom. Joe, where are we finding you this fine Friday morning? Friday morning for me, anyways. Yeah, Friday, Friday afternoon for me. My, my week is winding down here. Uh, on a, I live in a little place called the Isle of Wight, which is just off the south coast of the UK, uh, kind of a couple of hours south of London, if you if you know the UK at all. So, yeah, I'm there. And, um, yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Uh, thanks for having me on, man. I'm, I'm excited. I'm looking forward to this. No, this is great. The second time we've had, uh, you know, personally, you've been a huge help for me. So I appreciate mm-hmm. you taking the time to uh, chat with some other folks. Um, just quickly give us a little, I've got some questions obviously I'm going to ask you, but give folks a quick background, what you kind of do day in and day out to help make the world a better place. <laughs> Hopefully <laughs> help make the world a better place. So fundamentally, uh, I work in leadership and team dynamics. What that essentially means for me is, is working with people. Uh, I think, you know, there's plenty of, you know, there's, there's lots of other consultants out there who can, you know, get much more granular with you around, you know, processes and systems and all that kind of stuff, which is really, really important. But I think that the work that I do is, is sort of a level back from that. It's about the people that are in your organization, you know, how, how are they doing? Are, are they getting on with each other? You know, is your system, is your organization perhaps getting a little bit, you know, kind of, politicky and and you know things aren't quite as smooth as you'd like them to be and then you know working with business leaders as well helping them to you know figure out who they are and how they want to show up in the world no it's super important and uh like i said you've been super helpful for me sorting out even uh trying to figure out you know what i'm trying to accomplish even on a small scale so you know working with leaders entrepreneurs and executives is uh super important and oftentimes you know when you're at the top of the pyramid, you don't really have a lot, a lot of people you can really talk to internally. So it's good to have an outside voice to kind of bounce ideas off. So I want to talk about a few questions, like from your website, you talk about, you know, mm-hmm. culture happens, which I love. And if you could just expound on that, like what exactly when you're saying culture happens, can you chat about that? Yeah, I think that it's really easy to overcomplicate culture and for me, Seth Godin puts it the best. He just says that culture is the way we do things around here. And that is a really, really simple way of thinking about it. But for me, it's a really important way of thinking about it. Culture is it's how you do things. It's, it's how people talk to each other. It's how you talk to your clients. It's how you talk to your customers. It's how you behave around each other. And all of those little behaviors and all of those little mannerisms and you know the the little pieces of language that people use they all accumulate into this big kind of nebulous thing that that we call culture and when i say culture happens i say that because people are always doing things so everything that you do and that your team does is reflecting your culture out into the world and so really it then boils down to are you Are you going to think about that or are you just sort of going to let it happen? And I believe that it's more important to to think about it and try and shape it and define it and then decide what you want it to be rather than just, uh, we just kind of figure it out as we go on and let it happen and hopefully it will be okay. Yeah. Hope is never, never a sound strategy. And yeah, I think about my own business or when I'm advising folks around communications, Mm -hmm. you know, you can either uh, react to events or you can respond to events and it's much better to always respond to events. And you really talk about the same thing. Like, yeah, as you just, as a segue, you can either let culture happen or you can define it up front. And I think the folks, I'm just guessing with the folks you work with, it's hard enough getting your business off the ground, but you really should have intentionality from the start or some kind of vision or grand purpose of what you're trying to build, not just from a customer service standpoint, but yeah, what kind of team do you want to build? How are you going to do stuff? Can you talk about, you know, the importance of defining your culture almost from day one? Hmm. I, I think it's it's something that everyone should should think about, but also accept the fact that it's going to change. It's, it's going to evolve. You know, interestingly, actually, uh, a client that I've been working with for, for two years now, and we've been through, I don't know, three, four iterations of who they are, what they stand for. And, you know, and they've arrived at one, you know, literally just in the last couple of weeks that they're really proud of. And it's brilliant. And it's, it's a real kind of statement of who they are. But I've 
you know, I've said to that team, this is great, but this is who you are now and it will continue to evolve. So, yeah, it's absolutely crucial to to get this stuff happening from the from the start. But if it can be difficult when people approach it with the idea that, yeah, OK, right, we're going to do one two hour workshop. And at the end of it, we're going to have our mission statement <laughs> and it's going to be down on a piece of paper and that's it. And that's all we've got to do. And it's like, no, that's that's not how it happens. That can be a that can be a useful start point, but it is just a start point. You have to keep engaging with it. It's. Yeah, it's it's like so many other pieces of business, right? It's the same with the work that you do with comms, right, Mark? You 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 go, you can't just kind of go, oh right, like here is a press release and th- there you go, that's it, that's us, that's the end of it. It's like no, no, no. <laughs> it's like okay, then something else happens and you have to respond to that, and then something else happens, and then you know a new platform turns up and you have to figure out, you know, actually how do we engage, you know, how do we engage on TikTok? You know, does that work the same for us? Uh, I think you know. Yeah, they, they, these things, they're constantly changing, constantly evolving. And the role of someone like me is, is, is to help keep that as a priority for people to, to yeah. have it, something that you do rather than just, oh, yeah, we need to get to that, but we never quite get around to it. It seems very akin to, uh, this is a two part, like it, it's like tending to a garden, right? Like you've got like at the beginning of the, the season, you intend to plant various fruits yeah. and vegetables, and that might be the macro kind of goal or the mission, right? And then it's like, how do we actually produce this bountiful farm at the end of the season? Um, that did too about evolving as leaders. Like, you know, one day you're a founder, then you move on to like a manager, you have a small team, and then you're an executive. Um, it's super important, I guess, recognize that where you are today is, you know, your vision may be to do X, but you've got to recognize that you need to move and evolve. Can you talk about um, the resistance? Maybe people don't want to evolve or graduating to the next level. Yeah, that's that's a tricky one. Uh, I, I, for me, again, that 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 comes back to this, this idea of of values. You know, who are you, and how do you want to show up in the world? Because so often we can get caught up in this idea of. You know, we have to, you know, we have to move forward. We have to keep progressing. We have to grow. Everything has to get bigger, 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 more, more, more. And I, I push back against that a little bit, actually, I, because I think fundamentally that as a sort of overall uh, sort of way to operate the overall system, you know, I think it's, it's going to break eventually. You know, you can't have infinite growth on a, on a finite planet. Eventually that runs out. Right. And so I think in terms of that journey for, for an individual from founder to wherever they want to get to, again, I, I feel a little bit like I'm a, like, like I've been a bit of a stuck record here, but, but it's fundamentally, it's the same thing. It, it's, it's you, you understanding who you are and then understanding how far do you want to go? Again, I, I, if I compare two clients, I've got one, you know, uh, early 20s and wants to take over the entire world, you know, runs, runs a, a, a design company and, you know, really wants to push forwards. The last couple of years have been really challenging, but he absolutely, you know, he wants, you know, offices in multiple countries and hundreds of staff and all this kind of stuff. <laughs> and then on the other end of the scale, I've got, you know, a, a client who runs a small team, you know, it's only, there's only half a dozen of them and he is really, really happy there. And so then it becomes about, you know, helping him to understand that it's okay to to be there to, and to stay there, and that you don't have to get bigger and you don't have to grow if you don't want it. So again, it's I talk about a lot with clients. It's a self awareness. You know, do you understand yourself, and do you understand what that means to your business? I like that. Yeah, the need of self awareness, and um, you know, you talk a lot about just team dynamics, right? And this yeah. this idea about quote unquote good team dynamics, like. That seems like elusive, but also necessary at the same time. Like, but is there such a thing as good team dynamics? I mean, uh, how do you get there? Is it does it really exist? Because if we're constantly evolving or trying to reshape the the culture, um, how do you stress that? Or is it unachievable? That's that's like an eighteen part question. But I'm really interested in this idea of like, oh, we have a good team dynamic, you know. But what does that really mean? For me, if you, if you talk about having good team dynamics, what that means is that there is an, an 
an acceptance and an understanding within the team that we're not always going to agree about everything hmm. and that we can talk about it without people throwing their toys out of the pram or getting upset. It's a, it's, and, and that's a two-way process. That's, that's about how I talk to you respectfully, but also saying, but I don't agree with you around that. And that's also around how you respond to that feedback. So, yeah, th there are, you know, there's, there's, there's tools, there's techniques, there's, you know, there's, there's ways that you can, you can do that. You can, you can um, kind of have those conversations, you know, someone like Brenny Brown, she talks about, you know, one of the phrases she uses is let's rumble as a sort of pre-frame for someone to say, okay, this is going to be a conversation that's going to be quite challenging. And you say, okay, I need a rumble with you this afternoon. That's like, oh, okay, this is not just a little kind of get together and a discussion. This is, there's a there's a little challenge somewhere. There's a problem. There's something that we need to need to think about. And that tiny little that tiny little pre framing of the conversation, so that you're going into it, going, okay, I know what this is going to be. I don't know what the specific challenge is going to be, but I need to have this head on. I need to have my kind of open heart here so that I can engage in this conversation. So for me, that's a that's a huge part of, of successful team dynamics is being able to navigate those those tricky conversations with each other. That's that I would say that's the most important bit. There's a lot more to it than that, but that's a crucial part of it. So yeah, like good team dynamics is recognizing like, yeah, there's gonna be scrapes, there's gonna be scraps, it's okay to not always agree. And some days it's gonna be sunshine and we're at the beach. So yeah. but you need both. You need the yin and the yang to quote unquote yeah. have good team dynamics. If it's positive all the time, that can't be good, right? Because it's there's people either aren't being honest with each other or they're not they're not in an environment where they feel they can talk freely. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. You you're just in a yeah. It, yeah, if you're not having disagreement somewhere down the line, that probably should be a warning sign because it, it it's just you might have it for a, for a day or two. <laughs> right. But if, if you're having, you know, if you literally feel like there's been no kind of tension, no disagreement within your team, you know, for weeks on end, that's probably a warning sign. It's probably a sign exactly as you said, Mark. It's probably a sign that people aren't actually saying what's really on their mind. So yeah, that that's a that's an interesting one to to pick up on and you know yeah yeah you made it we're obviously in a very interesting time uh we're coming i don't know we're, mm. i don't know if we're in a pandemic epidemic like we're you know we're still dealing with covid um we're over two years into this process you know things are starting to come back here in the states but you know only if some of the big major bench positive areas only a third to 40 percent of workers are back in kind of the urban core most of us are still working remote some kind of hybrid situation um and we have a lot of dreams and ambitions at the same time, but you, you made that recent post about the quote, quote, good enough, like hmm. recognizing, um, and maybe this gets back to like self-awareness, but can you talk about the idea of good enough and embracing good enough? It doesn't always have to be, you know, the Olympics and winning the, the gold medal. Sometimes being in the game is good enough. Yeah, it, it's, it, it's a really important piece of it. So much of, you know so, so much of the sort of cultural expectation is again it comes back to this idea of you know constantly pushing ourselves we all know you know most of us i'm sure have been in those in those work environments where it's almost a competition as to who worked the most hours this week and you know and that's just there's, there's growing awareness that that is number one is toxic and unhealthy and also number two it's actually not the way to be the most productive. Just, just if, if all you're doing is counting the number of hours, <laughs> there's a fairly good chance that you're not spending those hours particularly wisely. Right. So I, so I think it's, I think it's that. I, I think my, the, the idea of good enough is partly to do with going, having the confidence and again, self-awareness to say, what, what game am I playing here? And is it one that I want to to continue playing in terms of, you know, what, what your organization might be asking of you? And then the second piece to it is that so often, you know, there's this the sort of search for, for perfection, which right. we all know doesn't exist. Actually, that becomes an excuse for for 
for procrastination, for, for not doing the thing that needs to be done. No, 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 you can't have this piece of work. It's not finished because I, I need to improve it. I need to improve it. And there is a point at which we need we need the discipline and self-awareness to go, yes, I could make this better, but right now this is good enough. And it's not right. an excuse for being lazy. It doesn't mean that you're cutting corners, but it does mean that you're going, yeah, this, you know, in terms of what I'm being asked, whether that's, you know, how much you're being paid or how many hours you've got to work or you, whatever the expectations around that might be, there is a point at which you, we, we have to learn to say, yep, this is good enough. And that obviously, you know, for me, that applies to to so many things, you know, that applies to, um, you know, sort of even, you know, family life and things like that. You go, yeah, like you can always, one can always be, you know, a better husband, a better father, a better whatever. Right. But, you know, uh, there's a point at which, you know, we have to learn to to balance all of these things. And, and yeah, so for me, that, that idea of good enough is a, is a really, really important one. I like um, on your social, you know, I follow you on Insta mm -hmm. and the way you use Insta and uh, also, you know, you do sketches and drawings and yeah. You're posting photos from the wonderful beach setup you have there, which is always envious. Um, but also, you know, using outside inspiration. Like you, you had a recent post about Bruce Lee, mm -hmm. leadership, and uh, you know, I love these. Um, I love, for me personally, looking at especially when I write or just communicate work with people, finding outside examples that maybe aren't connected and bringing them together and looking for other role models. Like, you know, Bruce Lee on leadership is Bruce Lee. You know. Should, is he the leadership model we should be looking for? Like, or just finding inspiration from him as a character? I, I'm. Hmm. I, so, do we want to follow Bruce Lee as a leadership model? I mean, well, Bruce that's a good question. But you, like no. the post you wrote about, you know, Bruce Lee as a, yeah. as on leadership, I thought was really compelling. Yeah. No, no, I was, no, I, I, I was being a little facetious <laughs> there, Mark. Uh, it's. So I think that it's really important to, to draw on lots of different resources, lots of different things that inspire, you know, I, I think, you know, you do this really well, actually, Mark, it's, you know, one of the most interesting things that I've read in the last, you know, 12, 18 months, well, I can't remember what it was, but it was your piece on the Barclay Marathons, which I'd never heard of before. <laughs> then. And I found that really, that really got me thinking about, you know, sort of meeting challenges and how you might set up events, you know, it got, it got me thinking about things in a really different way. So, yeah, I, I think it's really important because we never know, you know, we never know who, what's, what's going to land. And so, you know, for me, I, I was always interested in, in um, Kung Fu growing up and I did, I studied Kung Fu for, for quite a long time. So there's an interest in that, that sort of Eastern philosophy already for me. And you know, you mentioned yin yang earlier, and and that is that is sort of part of it for me. You know, Bruce Lee had this this expression about you know be like water. This, this right. idea that you you know you don't meet force with force. That that you know if you be like water, you can you move in and around the you know the the incoming force. And you know, whilst that's not specifically what that that actual post was about, that post was just a a, a quote from Enter the Dragon. You know, the scene on the on the on the boat will know. You know, the the piece about you know the art of fighting without fighting. And I wondered whether that would be applicable to to leadership. What I meant by that was, you know, I think that in my view, the the time for you know sort of you know, drum bashing, like, rah, you know, aggressive, loud leadership, you know, that's not, that's not me, that's not my style. And I'm not sure it's what the world needs right now. I think what we need is a, is a, is a gentler version of leadership. That doesn't mean it's, doesn't mean it's weak, but I think it, it needs to be more, you know, supportive and encouraging rather than, you know, kind of beating people over the head. So. <laughs> Which is sort of ironic when you, you know, because most people's perception of Bruce Lee is him beating people over the head. So well, there you go. There's the yin and yang again. Yeah, no, that quote, be like water is, uh, yeah, it's one of my favorite uh, just kind of reminders. And, you know, water is super powerful mm -hmm. and, you know, it can be a force for good and a force for evil. But, um, yeah, I love that quote. I, I'm interested, too, in your background. I've always been very interested in musicians for a number of reasons, the ability to obviously play drums or music or sing, I find 
super compelling or just, you know, people can hear songs and write them. I just find that magical. I have no idea how to do that. Um, but also like entrepreneurship, you know, being in a band and musician is one of the most entrepreneurial gig driven, you know, no safety net experiences in the world. Um, and I think there's a lot of lessons there. People can learn just how to market and sell themselves, you know, just from the world of music. Um, being a professional musician, being in a band, you know, can you, am I overplaying this, but it does seem like that's a great breeding ground for leadership dynamics, dealing with uh, all kinds of personalities, the stress, the travel, um, mm. performing in front of people, you know, getting on stage when you maybe don't want to. Is yeah. being in a band been helpful to you? A hundred percent. Although I think it took me, it took me a long time to realize how much I'd learned from from being yeah from being a musician from being in different bands and you know being doing some promotion putting on shows and, and things as well it i didn't it, it music, music is such a it, it's an industry that's so removed from what you know conventional business that within you know within that part of the music industry people don't talk about things in the same way they don't they don't talk about you know marketing and hr and marketing. right but the same fundamental things are going on those same skills are being developed those same skills are required to, to be successful at it and i think unquestionably i learned a huge amount from it mainly around you know there are few environments that that are you know as, as sort of uh you know where you can be clumped together for quite a long time <laughs> right a group of people so you know you learn a lot about how to get on with other people <laughs> when you're, when you're you know traipsing up and down the country in the back of a van it, you know like it's yeah that that part of it is is really really crucial a and yeah I, I think the other thing that I think I'd like to say about that is that if there are other people out there who have you know that perhaps slightly unusual background like i do it took me a long time it took me a long time to build up the confidence to start talking about those other parts of my background because i hmm. felt that they were irrelevant i felt that because the language was different and all those kind of things i was like right you know what is someone who runs a marketing company what do they want to know about being in a band and actually you know being able to draw on those different experiences and tell different so sorts of stories and present the same idea, but in a different way, that's actually a really useful thing to be able to do. So, yeah, I, I think that's probably, yes, it developed my skills, but I think the stories that it gave me, that's been the most useful part of it, actually. You know, and you've done, um, yeah, I want to finish up too, like these last few questions are about you as like an entrepreneur yourself or yeah. how you market your services and, Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think your your little the sketches you do um, they may seem kind of rudimentary, but they're super powerful. And you know, a lot of them are from your experiences. You know, sitting behind a drum kit, and um, I th for me personally, I think they've been great. And I'd encourage you to keep telling your stories about being a musician. Um, talk about how you're using kind of social, and I'd love to hear. It. I'm obviously you just launched a new website, going through that process, and kind of your own branding. Um, what do you what have you learned are you uh, is it still useful are you finding other creative ways how are you using you know these various digital tools to market yourself there was a when i went through the the rebrand and redesign which was towards the back end of last year i sat down with with scott the the designer and the first thing that i did was i sent him links to three websites from other consultants um and basically I said, this is what I don't want. Hmm. And there's nothing at all wrong with any of those websites. They, they were good websites. But, you know, like, like if, you, if, if I loosely class myself as a consultant, that's, that's fundamentally what I do. Anyone listening to this, you can probably imagine what a consultant's website looks like. You can probably imagine, you know, the color schemes, the types of photographs that are being used, the type of language, you know, which, you know, that sort of jingo bingo type idea. And <laughs> right. you know, those are the things. And I, and I said to I said to Scott, I said, I don't want to compete in that space. I want to do something that's totally different. And so there is quite a conscious effort, actually, with with that stuff. The website in particular 
you know, it, it, it does act, you know, it does act as a filter. It's, it's quite unusual. I think it's very reflective of me and, and who I am. And it will, you know, it, as, as I just said, it, it, it's a filter. Um, I think, you know, nine out of 10 people will arrive at the homepage and go, what the hell is this? Like, right. oh my God, that's, I, that's not for me. And, and great, great, good. But the one out of 10 who do, you know, dig a little bit deeper into it, they may not all turn into clients, but they will be, you know, they will be the sort of person I think that I want to, that, 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 that I can offer value to, that I can help. So yeah. Yeah, there, there is a, there's a, there's a very conscious, there's a very conscious decision by me to, to, to be myself. If that doesn't sound too pretentious, <laughs> of kind of going, yeah, I'm not, I'm not trying to be, you know, I'm not trying to be uh, someone else. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm doing this. I do it in a certain way that won't be for everybody. But if you have tried, you know, um, quite often the people that work with me have tried that more conventional coach consultancy type thing, you know, through, you know, an eight step program of some description. And for whatever reason, it, it didn't really work out for them. And they, yeah, they want to try a different approach. And, you know, if that's, yeah, that, that's kind of what I, what I offer. Yeah. Yeah. I love that idea of almost starting from no. I think that's really powerful. Like it's very easy to be like, oh, I want, but to be like, I don't want, or this is no. Yeah. Um, Seth Godin talks about this a lot, like the idea about constraints, you know, like constraints can be really powerful. Sports would not be, you know, professional NFL football would not be that great if the field, if there were no rules, right? So having, you know, all our sporting events that we enjoy, um, it's helpful to have rules and constraints and, you know, starting from a place from there and then developing. I, I like that idea. And um, yeah, not being for everyone is a super powerful tool. There's no doubt about that. Yeah, and it's funny, you know, Seth Seth Godin's come up a couple of times in this conversation, and you know, he is he is someone that I look to, you know, a lot. Uh, I've done, you know, several of his courses and, and and bits and pieces, you know, and and he talks about that, doesn't he? He talks about, you know, sort of, you know, minimum viable product or minimum viable audience or whatever right. however you want, to, you want to define it. And you know, that was something that I thought about quite carefully. You know, I don't need or want particularly enormous numbers of clients. I, I don't I don't want or need a hundred clients. I need a dozen or so. And so right. if I'm only going to work with a small number of people, I do want to make sure that that you know that I can really give value to those people and that they are the type of people that I do want to work with. So yeah, there there is a, you know, and and as I say this, I can feel my, you know, I can feel myself kind of going, oh, oh, oh. you know, it sort of sounds a bit, you know, it sort of sounds kind of arrogant to say there's only a certain type of person that I want to work with. But you know, you have to kind of lean into that and go, no, that's that's okay, that's okay. Yeah. Can you talk about? Um, I mean, you had a background in obviously organizing all kinds of events, and we, we talked about musician stuff. And do you see as a marketer as yourself like do you see more collabs happening do you see more events happening um do you see new opportunities for how stuff is networked i wonder if that's on your plate in terms of a, a marketing channel yeah it, de it definitely is I, I think particularly after the last couple of years uh it, i know I, I speak for myself when i the biggest challenge that i've had over the last couple of years has been you know, being a, a freelancer, so it's just me, there's no team or anything, it's it, everything is me. I have found it quite wearying to just yeah. make every single decision, like every single decision about everything. And, you know, you, you, I get to the point some days where it's just like, Jesus Christ, can someone else decide what I'm having for dinner tonight? <laughs> I mean, I don't even want to make that decision. And so I know as I talk to, number one, other professionals doing similar things to me, they're in a similar sort of boat. So we are talking to each other about how we might collaborate. And I think that the organizations that we work for and with, they are also starting to think the same thing is that, yeah, with the, the, the getting different views, different angles, different approaches from different people within the same, you know, within the same um, workshop or, or, you know, 
retreat, whatever it might be, you know, that, that's, that's even more valuable now. And so, yeah, I, I, yeah, I, I definitely think that people's, yeah, the, the appetite is there for, for more of that kind of thing. And I know it's something I want to do. Yeah. And our, our buddy Blair N talks about this, like, you know, obviously out of all the travesty and de destruction that's come out of COVID and the pandemic, I mean, there's no better time to try to some other ideas or try some new experiments. Like there's almost uh, we've been blessed with an opportunity to use the situation to kind of pivot and try new things. So um, mm -hmm. yeah, I'm hopeful that there'll be some new, I don't know. I, I do, I've been out and about more myself and I feel like there's, you know, people are percolating for some new ideas and new engagement and, um, as wonderful as digital is, it's super, it's amazing how powerful it is to be uh, face to face and meeting with people in various settings, not requiring a camera, uh, lighting and, you know, audio equipment. <laughs> I, I, th I think that's really important, Mark. I, it, it, you know, it, it went on, you know, the whole kind of everything digital, everything remote thing. It went on for so long in the end that I, I think... I certainly managed to convince myself that it was it was almost as good as being in person. And then in the last, you know, I think the the, the you know the first in person thing I did was probably September, so six months ago, something like that. And within fifteen minutes of doing that first in person event, I was like in my head, ah, <laughs> this is what we've been missing. Yeah. Right. Okay. So there's absolutely, you know, things like this, right? You and I, we're, you know, 3,000 miles apart, whatever it is. And so the, the acceptance of stuff like this is obviously fantastic. Um, you know, I'm on, you know, two or three webinars most weeks with people, with folks from all over the world talking about all kinds of different things. That, that wasn't happening two or three years ago. So that's amazing. But actually doing the kind of deep work around things like, you know the culture that we started with you know that kind of stuff yes there's an amount of it that you can do online but it is better in person and i think as we all get more used to that we'll we'll yeah we'll remind ourselves of, of how that stuff works and how important it is so let's finish up uh our last question what are you reading or watching you know it can be anything serious frivolous i don't know something you want to share with the uh the global brigadoon audience uh, okay it can um, be anything. No, uh, no pressure. It can be uh, you know as cheeky as uh, something on Bravo television, okay. reality TV, or uh, something highbrow. Like I'm gonna give you three. Okay, you three. three. Love it. Yeah. So we 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 the NFL came up, but it's not just the NFL. If you haven't come across bad lip reading on YouTube, okay, check it out. <laughs> Especially the NFL stuff. The, the, the hilarious, absolutely brilliant. <laughs> Bad lip reading. Perfect. The second one is um, I've just uh, I've there's this this Dutch graphic designer who is renovating a couple of cabins in the Italian Alps. Oh no! These, Here we go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He makes these beautifully slow paced weekly videos with hardly any chat and stuff in it, and they're almost it's almost a meditation. So his name is Martin with a J, so M-A-R-T-I-J-N, Doolard, D-O-O-L-A-R-D. Go check out his, the, the videos of him uh, on the, you know, up in the Italian Alps. You'll, you'll, I think, I'm there. I'm, you know, already, I'm, already, I'm already loving everything I'm hearing about this. And then I, I'll, leave you with, I'll leave you with a highbrow one, which is uh, a few weeks back I finished reading The Wizard and the Prophet, which is uh, an extraordinarily balanced take on why the climate conversation has not moved forwards as much hmm. as perhaps it should have done uh it, it's it's a bit of an investment it's quite a tome but it reads really easily and it, it's it's really it's just it's it's excellent it's just an excellent to, um, discussion of of you know the entirety of, of of the climate and it is yeah highly recommended no, fantastic. I'm definitely going to uh, check that out. I love these three recommendations. Um, as an aside, I went to, I was at a climate event this week. Uh, it was the Bloomberg Green Summit, and it was uh, full on, you know, everything about climate, energy, all this kind of good stuff. And uh, 
people that are doing climate day in and day out, man, tend to be a bit dour. Like it's just not, you know, talking about good enough. Like they're just feeling like they're fighting an endless battle. And uh, I don't know, to me, there seems like there's a lot of exciting things going on. And I love this idea of profit too, because there was a quote where uh, Bernie, uh, Barack Obama, when he was running for president, said to Bernie Sanders, you know, you can either be a prophet or you can be, you know, a king. And uh, sometimes uh being a prophet like bernie sanders you know sometimes you got to make a decision and so i don't know if this book talks about that but I'm, i love this idea of the wizard and the prophet it's fantastic yeah it's, it's essentially it's 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 balancing the 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 two sides of you know do we need to revert to nature and and and, and go back and accept that we're part of this enormous ecosystem or do we need to push forwards with the science and look for kind of scientific solutions? That's that's the essential kind of thing that's that's going on in there. So so yeah, it's interesting. And I mean, yeah, I don't want I don't want to finish on a <laughs> I don't want to finish on downer. But there's just a, there was a really interesting thing that I read this week. Uh, obviously, you know, Elon is is I, I don't actually know has he actually bought Twitter or is he hasn't officially bought it yet, but uh, yeah. he's you know putting the cash together, but. Yeah, and it was just a very interesting thing to me. So, so the figure on that is forty-four billion dollars, yeah. and I think um, Biden's proposed climate budget was forty-four point nine billion dollars. Yeah. And I think that's a really interesting. I think that's yeah. a really interesting statement of of where our priorities are and, and how we're looking at things at the moment. And that's something that I, yeah, that I personally am I'm questioning at the moment. Well, I'm going to leave it a positive. I actually feel like Elon's doing something that we can't fully imagine with Twitter, and there's going to be something powerful there. Um, I think there's a lot of interesting science that's happening. Um, one of the lectures I saw at the Green Summit was this guy was even finding a way to make batteries without lithium, so that'll have other kind of mining implications. And I don't know. Hopefully, uh, yeah, the tech is there, man. I, I'm feeling optimistic about the future. I think all this, it's been a fun week. Elon, the NFL draft, you know. Yeah, there's lots going on. I'm going to leave you with, with we're going to finish on kind of optimism around the climate. <laughs> so, no, this is a good one. So I was at a TEDx event uh, a couple of months back, and there was a speaker there, um, very, very smart guy, Dr. Adrian Gill. He's, he's chief engineer for Vestas, who are, I, I, in the States you may not be familiar, but they're a huge European wind time. Wind the wind farm, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And he goes one of the, one of the statistics from there, which was on their latest wind turbines, one rotation of the blades from one wind turbine generates enough electricity for an electric car to travel 180 kilometers. Wow. Yeah. So one rotation. So, so the tech is there. The tech is there. We just need to get it out into the world. I love it. That's a good positive thing. I hope so. I believe so. so thanks for joining Brigadoon Radio. My absolute um, pleasure. We'll see you soon. <laughs>